there it's on. Well, good evening, everybody. I see some familiar faces, lots of familiar faces. I see a few that I don't recognize right off, but we wanted to, uh, I wanted to welcome you. I'm Dr. David Lowe. I'm head of the health ministries here at the church. And this is our kind of final main event that we have for the community this weekend. And we've had Dr. Arlene Taylor here at least five years running now and um, since she wants to live to 122 we can go at least an, uh, over 22 more years 32 more years yes but I'm around or not but I have I hope I hope hope to be right behind her so we want to welcome you um, for this weekend. Tonight's the first presentation and just to show you how uh, how ageless she is, she's going to give four presentations tomorrow. Two in the morning and two in the afternoon. So uh, this is the first of five and she is offering continuing education credits for nurses and some of the ancillary uh, areas can sometimes use those nursing credits for their continuing education as well. So that's being offered and that's a free service. If you want to apply for that, just uh, see me or Dr. Taylor afterwards. We can give you the forms to fill out. Okay, so anyway, uh, again, we have a, we're just delighted to welcome her because she comes, what I like about Dr. Arlene is that, you know, some people just have kind of one thing they do all repetitively over and over and over again and they can do it well but it's the same thing if you ask them next year they'll talk about the same thing and the following year is the same thing and so but Dr. Arlene always even keeps tracks of all of the presentations she gives here and then she always comes up with five more new ones so you know that she's always continually getting new material reformatting reformulating doing all those types of things to, to make it new and to update and to keep us on the cutting edge of, of what we're learning about the brain and that she has no trouble doing that now because our knowledge of the brain and the mind have been exponentially exploding and increasing year by year. So it's probably hard to even keep up with all of that new information but she has a way of synthesizing it, putting it in new ways for us in, and easy for the un uneducated in regards to the brain and the mind to understand. And she does it in a nice, easy, and entertaining way. So we're going to have, I just want to let you know that afterwards we'll have some things to give away that she has authored or been involved with. So you want to stick around for that. But um, just want to uh, welcome you again. And Dr. Arlene, thank you so much for being with us this weekend. We're looking forward to hearing a lot and tonight it's on growing older gracefully, right? We only have two other options. 
ungracefully or not growing older. So before she starts, let's, uh, I'd like to offer a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for your blessings on us and that we can be here as we begin the Sabbath day. And we thank you for the gifts that you've entrusted to Dr. Arlene with her gift of speaking and her gift of learning and her gift of imparting knowledge. So we ask that you will bless her and speak through her and uh, help her to give us ways in which we can indeed uh, age gracefully in a way that will be pleasing to you and a blessing to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I do a lot. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> I do a lot of speaking lately outside of the United States, but I try to save about eight weekends a year for eight special places that I go back to every year to do a brain conference. And this is one of them. Although I'm not sure that I appreciate everything Dr. Lowe always says about my age. <laughs> All right, so tonight let's just have fun. I always do research, but I've packaged it a little bit different tonight, a little differently. And uh, let's see what we can learn. And ask yourself, I'm going to go through five sections and we're going to do some puzzles and things like that. As we do each one, ask yourself, where am I in this particular construct? You know, I've got this nailed, am I doing this? Or is this something that I really need to look at? I've started prefacing when I do a brain conference by saying, some of you probably didn't know Edison. I certainly didn't, Dr. Lowe. But he reportedly said, the brain is so important that your body's chief job is to transport it, to carry it around. And sometimes people go, wait a minute, why is that important? Well, it's important that you keep your body healthy so that you can transport your brain. Otherwise, you'd be stuck in one place. Doesn't mean you couldn't do a lot of things, but you're stuck in one place. But if you don't keep your brain sharp, what's the point of the body hauling it around? So it's really a two-way street. So tonight we're talking about growing older gracefully. And research shows that the older we get, the more like who we really are, we become. Did you get that? The older we get, the more like who we really are, we become. Meaning that the prefrontal cortex, where you have inhibition, and when we were younger, and somebody said something or did something we didn't like, we might not have much of a filter and just tell them you know, that we don't like that. And the inhibition would keep us from doing that. Well, as we get older and the brain loses energy and we lose some of that inhibition, we lose uh, the filter. And so you sometimes see people who are quite old who are not very nice. Their behaviors are not very um, conducive to relationships. And people will say, well, I don't understand this. They used to be such a nice person. Well, the filter was working. And then you see people who are very elderly and they're just delightful to be around. Their filter isn't working, but that's really who they are. So I tell you, if you don't want to be a pain in the patootie when you get very old, and a super centenarian, you know, has to be at least 110 years old. I want to live much longer than that. If you don't want to be a pain and people don't want to be around you, you better start now developing the characteristics that you want to display then 
because otherwise they're going to know what you were really like. And that may not always be wonderful. All right. How many of you have been here when we did brain benders before? A few of you. All right, let's do some tonight. These are whole brain anti-aging strategies. You can go to my website, arlenetaylor.org. I'm an org. There are hundreds of these on my website. You can practice them for 10 minutes a day. They're anti-aging, they're whole brain, because with your left hemisphere, regardless of handedness, language seems to be loaded in the left side of the brain, you can read the, now let me see if I can find this little, there we go. You can read the letters, you can combine them into words, but you can't usually come up with a phrase without the help of the right hemisphere that looks at the relationship with the letters to each other in the box and so on and so forth. So let's see what you do with these. How about top left? What might that stand for? It could be the left corner. It could be the right corner because of what? What kind of an angle is it? It's a right angle. So it could be left corner, it could be the right corner, it could be around the corner. There's no right or wrong here, there's just what I thought of and your brain could get really creative and think of a lot more. Now, this is a word in a word. One starts here and goes this way and one starts here and goes that way. Word in a word. Did you hear what Dr. Lowe said? Foot, F-O-O-T in D-O-O-R, foot in the door. You see how these are done? All right, let's go. Uh, how about the third on the left? The word is travel, but what's in the word? Four, all right, be very literal. Foreign travel, for in travel, foreign travel, got it? You're good. All right, how about this one? And the brain does not care if the letters go forwards or backwards. You could read an entire book with every word written backwards, as long as the first and the last letters were accurate. So what's the word? Loyalties. Fourth on the left. I think that's the one we're on. The word is loyalties. You Divided loyalties, split loyalties. All right, top right. The word is clean. What's the shape? An X. Kleenex, good job. All right, second on the right. There's two words there, but they're, they share a common letter. The first word is what? Fine. What's the second word? Me. Oh, it could be man. Now we might be able to figure out another solution. So how, what, what would that say? What kind of a phrase? It could say fine man. I never even thought of that. That's brilliant. <laughs> I think it must be a man who figured that one out. You, you want my solution? Fine by me. Fine by me. But I like fine men. I actually know a bunch of them. <laughs> Ted Benson's one of them. He's keeping my voice going here. All right, this one should be very easy for you. Third on the right. Little Women. That's the name of a book. Did any of you read that book when you were younger? I love that book, Little, Little Women. It has nothing to do with size. All right, fourth on the right. 
The word is crack. Where is it in the box? I'm not telling you this one. Get creative. Crack is the word. Where is it in the box? It's up. Crack up. There you go. I think some of you might want to go to my website. Just saying. <laughs> These are really, really good for challenging your brain because you have to use both hemispheres. All right. I have entered the snapdragon part of my life. Part of me is snapped <laughs> and the rest of me is dragon. Okay, I have no desire <laughs> to have anything to do with that. And since we know that everything starts in the brain, more and more and more as people are understanding this, they're living longer and longer and longer there are centenarians and super centenarians all over the world in almost every country. So it depends what you want to do in life. I want to live a very long time because I'm having fun. I also want to have all my faculties and a good body to carry my brain around. Without a working body, how would I get here? All right. So, as Dr. Lowe said, research is just burgeoning about how to stay healthier and younger for longer, and I'm pretty excited about that. There are more cures coming out. There are more research studies that are giving us information. For example, I just got two new ones uh, this year talking about the discovery that autism appears to be a genetic disorder. And hopefully that's going to relieve a lot of people's anxieties because, you know, there have been all kinds of supposed reasons for autism. Poor parenting, for example, hello. So it looks like a couple of things are happening. In the brain we have neurons and we have other cells called glial cells that are the servants, the personal assistants for the thinking cells. Because the cells think, but they're not very good at taking care of themselves, which I find interesting. So in the brain, every neuron, and the ones you've got, except maybe for the hippocampus, your search engine, they're the ones you had when you were a little kid which is the reason it's really important what you do to take care of your brain because brain cells do not divide and multiply in general like the other cells in the body. Well, so they found that in autism the glial cells, those servants, and there are different ratios of those in the brain. We know that every neuron has at least one personal assistant, 24 hours a day. Fixes food for it, disposes of waste, all that kind of stuff. But some have nine. And one of the studies is isolating which, which neurons have the most helpers and trying to figure out why they need more helpers. Well, in autism, the research that just came out probably two months ago, some of those glial cells aren't working right. So they're not keeping the neurons healthy is what it's looking like. And secondly, I'm sure you remember from biology that if these, each hand is a neuron, they don't touch each other. If neurons touch each other, there's something wrong with them. What is the name of that little separation there. It's a synapse. Good. There seems to be a problem with the synapses and the way in which the information is transmitted. So it's pretty exciting to learn that and hopefully now 
they'll be able to do something a little different in terms of autism. Now that reminded me of another study that just came out. The AIDS epidemic was in full force about 19, I don't know, 85 is when we first discovered the HIV virus, but several years before that uh, we were already seeing cases, although people didn't really know what they were looking at. About 20 percent of people who got infected with the human immunodeficiency virus ended up with a dementia. And the theory was, back then, 1986, 1988, that the HIV virus was attacking the neurons and killing them. And so the research was trying to figure out a way to stop that from happening. Well, guess what they found out? The HIV was actually killing the helper cells. They were killing the glial cells. So they didn't fix food for the neurons. They didn't take the waste away from the neurons. And that is what turned the brain into a demented brain. And eventually the neurons died because the glial cells died. I just think it's fascinating. I don't know if you do, but I love this stuff, and I know you can't tell. Anyway, the good news about aging is this. More than half the factors that impact aging are within your partial, if not complete, control. For example, we know that smoking cigarettes is not good for the aging process. That's totally within your control. You have the capability to choose to avoid smoking. You have the capability to choose to avoid being around side smoke, all things being equal. Somebody told me the other day, well, my wife smokes and I, I have to breathe side smoke. I said, no, you don't. You tell her. If you want to stay married to me, you go out and smoke on the back porch. You never smoke in the house. And he goes, do you think I could do that? I said, I don't know. I could. I'm not breathing in somebody's side smoke. I may love them, but I'm not breathing in their side smoke. So, and beyond that, we now have information, uh, been out for a little while, Dr. Bruce Lipton, arguably the most knowledgeable person on this planet right now about the science of epigenetics. You know, genetics are your genes and chromosomes. You get them from your parents. You don't choose what you get. At least I didn't. I didn't even choose my parents. Not that I, I'm sorry I had the parents I had, but I didn't choose them. Genetics probably accounts for 30% or less of how well you are and how long you live. So it really doesn't matter who your parents were in most cases. Epigenetics is everything that's not genetics. And in a word, as Dr. Lowe puts it, that's lifestyle. It's worth at least 70 percent of how well and how long you live. So over half the factors that impact aging are within your partial if not complete control and 70 percent of how you age, if you want to term it that way, is lifestyle. So get with the program because it makes a difference. So five research strategies. Let's just do those five and I got to get moving and quit telling you so many stories because we really can't stay here the whole night. So here's the five and then we'll take them one at a time. These are things you can do now and they all start in the brain because everything starts in the brain. And this, by the way, is a positron emission tomography picture of a brain scan of a very healthy brain. And I'll show you some PET scan studies a little later of brains that are not quite so healthy. So remember how this looks. You know, here's the left hemisphere, and here's the right hemisphere, and here's the prefrontal cortex, and so on. So the five things. Increase your awareness. Choose a positive mindset. Live the 2080 rule. Be intentional. And have fun. And we're learning how important it is to laugh and have fun. I guess everybody doesn't know that. 
I do know that when I was growing up, it wasn't okay to laugh almost anywhere. And I don't know what happened to me, but I think I survived because I found almost everything funny. <laughs> uh, but my mother was always telling me, don't laugh. Okay, when you say don't laugh, what picture do you see in your head? Laughing. So I would only laugh louder. Well, I have a dent in my rib cage that I was not born with. Perfectly fits the shape of her elbow. I think that's funny. <laughs> All right, let's go. Increase your awareness. All right. As the brain gets older, it needs stimulation. And that's the problem with starting to lose your hearing. Because sound gives the brain a tremendous amount of stimulation. So well-meaning people will come to my office and, or somewhere and we'll be chatting and they go, what did, what did you say? And I'll speak louder and they'll say, can you speak louder? And I'm already almost shouting. And I go, do you have a hearing aid? Oh, I don't need a hearing aid. I'm not wearing a hearing aid. And I'm going, okay, big cause of dementia preventable cause of dementia in almost every case, the hearing aid would help more stimulation get to the brain. So, studies show that if you increase your awareness, you slow the process of aging because it's more stimulation for the brain. And some of you who are 15 think, oh yeah, right, start now. If you want to live to be 122, start now. Few caveats. You can only know what you pay attention to, which means that little kids are sitting in school, they just came from a home where there was a lot of arguing, their brains are downshifted, they're sick to their stomach, they're scared their parents are going to divorce. They are not paying attention. And so they flunk, and that just makes them feel worse about themselves. You are more likely to recall what you pay attention to because every night while you're sleeping, compare this to um, Hollywood. They're making a movie and during the day, the guys that do the filming are, f are filming all of these scenes. When they go home, they hand this footage to an editor and that night, the editor plays all of that footage, decides what's good, what needs to be redone, you know, which pieces are going to be kept. All right, the same thing happens in your brain while you're sleeping. Your hippocampus, your search engine, has all of the things that happened during the day filed in its short-term memory, if you will. And at night, it replays this, which is sometimes what triggers your dreams. It replays this for your prefrontal cortex, who's like the editor and says, we won't keep that, we will keep this, oh, scratch that. No, this stuff needs to be moved into long-term memory. And the question has been, how does it decide what to keep and what to throw away? Well, researchers believe that what it keeps is what you paid attention to. If you didn't pay attention to it, you know, the, the cortex says, oh, they didn't pay attention to that, it's not important. If you have paid attention, it is likely to keep it. And that also helps with anti-aging. You can only deal effectively with what you can identify, label, and describe. Again, that's brain stimulation. Can, could you label, identify, and describe everything that you saw while you were driving here tonight? Duh, of course not. Not unless you took a movie of it. 
But that analogy works. Choose to pay attention to what you want the brain to remember because it will be less likely that night to throw it out. How aware of, are you of what you're thinking? Are you thinking happy thoughts? Arlene, you are living to be at least 122 years old and Dr. Lowe is struggling to keep up with you. <laughs> or are, are you saying, my parents both died when they were 75. I think it's hopeless. What percent of lifestyle impacts your wellness and longevity? 70. It does not matter so much who your parents were. Are you aware of your facial expressions? I know a lot of people aren't, and sometimes I've looked at people and I thought, they must be having a really bad day. Look at them frowning. And I'll say to them, um, is something bothering you? No, nothing's bothering me. Why would you ask? And I want to say, go look in the mirror. It looks like you got one foot in the grave. You know, how are you looking? Because your mirror neurons know how you look. And it's not real excited about frowning and looking dismal. So Oliver Wendell Holmes, and I don't know how these people knew this. We didn't even have PET scans back then. Awareness is the first step on the continuum of positive change. So let's do a fast experiment. I want you to sit there, and I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to pull up in working memory right here in behind your forehead. What does the person look like sitting to your left? Do you even know their gender? What's the person look like who's sitting to your right? And hopefully that's not your spouse and you don't know. Uh, do you know who's sitting in front of you? Do you know what their hair looks like? Do that experiment and ask yourself, what are you paying attention to? Because you may be just sort of zoning through life. Increase your internal self-awareness, and this is key. Remember, you can only deal with what you can identify, label, and describe. So if somebody asks you, what are you feeling right now? Would you be able to label, identify, and describe how you're feeling? Start practicing. What's your EQ level? Emotional intelligence. We're going to talk about that tomorrow afternoon. Fabulous new research. Are you angry about anything? Do you know that? I'm not. I rarely get angry. I think it's kind of funny, frankly, to see somebody, you know, 50 years old and they're really mad about something. It's, they're, they're acting like a five-year-old and they're 50. Are you nervous about something? Are you afraid of anything? Do you feel calm? Are you sad? Are you energetic or lethargic? Are you well or unwell? Are you forgiving? Have you forgiven yourself? I forgot my deodorant today. Don't worry. Flow fixed me up. <laughs> I rarely forget something like that. I made an assumption, which is, we'll talk about that tomorrow, that's jot behavior. I made an assumption, since I hadn't done anything with my suitcase since the last trip, that everything would be in there. I don't know where it went. I think somebody at the, you know, airlines looked in my suitcase and stole it. But it wasn't there. So, I gotta forgive myself for forgetting, because I really, I really, that is not one of my goals. Are you able to forgive others for their mistakes? Because believe me, you're not flawless. And it sort of helps me sometimes when I forget my deodorant <laughs> to remember that um, I do make mistakes. Now, increase your surround awareness. And this is pretty important. Yeah, we're talking about what's the temperature like, what's the humidity. Those are things that's nice for you to pick up in the environment. But are the people in your environment positive or negative? And you're one of them, so what are you doing? 
What's the emotional atmosphere like where you are? Is it fearful because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake or not get it right? Or is it angry because this idiot over there did such and such, backed into my new car? You can't afford to be unforgiving because you're the one who's going to pay the biggest price because it releases all kinds of stress hormones in your body. What is your intuition telling you? You're not going to pay attention to that unless you're aware of your surroundings. And sometimes that awareness can save your life. I remember listening, I don't listen to a lot of news, but I remember listening to a program when they had the, that shooting, and I don't remember where it was in Paris, but there was this shooting, and a couple of people were interviewed, and the newscaster said, well, you were at such and such a place when this happened. How, how did you avoid this? And the couple said, we looked at each other and said, Something doesn't feel right here. I don't know what it is. And they said, all right, let's go. They got up and left. They avoided the shooting by like 30 seconds. Are you aware of your surroundings and paying attention to your intuition? Because your brain is taking in 10 million, I do know the word million, 10 million bits of observations per second. You cannot process that. But when you get this gut level feeling or something bothers you, it's because your brain has paid attention to your surroundings and it doesn't like something and it's trying to get your attention. And we poo poo intuition. Avoid making that mistake. So, Here's a couple questions to see what you've been paying attention to. Do con and avoid looking. Do conventional hard copy books, yes, they still make them, tend to have even numbered pages on the right side or on the left side? Are you aware of that? Where are the odd pages? Which side? Okay, we have a little difference of opinion here. No, it's not in the middle. All right, here's the answer. Odd is always on the right. So some of you got that. The rest of you may not have picked up a hard copy book for a long time or paid attention. What do you see in this picture? What are you aware of? Okay, who saw the fox? Did everybody see the fox? All right, who saw the rabbit? A few of you did. Have the rest of you found it? You may not be used to being aware. Anybody not have the rabbit? Okay, here we go, take a look. It's hard to see, but here's a little bunny rabbit right here hiding in the branches. There's lots of things like this. Sometimes you'll see them in the newspaper. Take time to do them because it's good for your brain. All right, choose a positive mindset. That's the second research because your brain can only do what it thinks you can do. And a positive mindset creates positive internal mental pictures which is a map for your brain to follow. It also so happens that a positive mindset programs your subconscious, and 80% of your brain and all of your body is part of your subconscious. It improves your health, it increases your energy, and helps you stay long, to stay younger longer. You choose if you're going to be positive or negative. Psychoneuroimmunology, Psycho or PNI, was a branch of science, of science that was started about uh, 1995, I think 95, maybe 85, last part of last century in Colorado. 
and it was designed to study how the mind and how the nerves and how the immune system all work together and what have they found they have found that every thought you think got it every thought you think alters your neurochemistry affects every cell in your body including your brain nervous system immune system and endocrine system so it's your choice about what you want to do do you know anybody who whines a lot it's very wearing is it not so they found that whining isn't going to help you in fact it's going to negatively impact your brain if you don't like something address it or let it go move you remove yourself from the environment if you need to avoid whining about what you no longer can do and as I say some of you shouldn't have been doing it anyway so focus on what you can do now here's a couple more of those PET scan studies now the brain on the left is happy and positive feeling good now life is not flawless but you can deal with it the brain on the right is a negative depressed brain which one do you want it's amazing to me how your thoughts clearly can be shown on a PET scan positive or negative what did you grow up hearing when you were a child some have heard you'll never amount to anything unfortunately that says more about the person who said that than the person to whom it was said but I'll tell you especially a child that can alter their life for decades I think I've told you this before I never fit into my family okay I love them but I never fit in I was not like any of them I uh, must have a throwback ancestor somewhere that I'm like I don't know my mother was the first college graduate in 15 generations on the maternal side that was a big deal I'm a first generation a second generation college graduate you know it's the 21st century and I'm only second generation well we were having a discussion one time when I was about 15 and my mother said to my brother little boil on the landscape of my life <laughs> because my parents wanted a boy and when I was born I wasn't and now we know that an, a fetus will know before it's born whether it's the right gender whether the environment it's coming into is welcoming and affirming or not well I didn't know what I was feeling but I wasn't a boy my mother wanted one child she wanted it to be a boy that was it I screwed up all around I wasn't even born on my dad's birthday and she wanted me to do that so she only had to do one birthday cake a year so 15 she says to my brother don't you want to be a doctor and he goes no keeps on chewing the dinner table she goes why don't you want to be a doctor I hate sick people I don't like blood he did not become a doctor so little Arlene says well mom if he doesn't want to be a doctor I'll be a doctor and what do you suppose she said you're not smart enough to be a doctor problem is I believed her for 30 years but it was not to make me feel bad you you have to look at your ancestors and what they say she was the first college graduate in 15 generations okay she wanted to make sure I went to college but a doctor for a female maybe two or three generations down the line I wasted 30 years believing her thinking that's why I felt different 
Look at what happened to you. What did people say to you that was erroneous and you're still believing it? Because it's only their brain's opinion and you're the one who knows your brain, hopefully. So Dr. Daniel Wegner talks about the white bear phenomenon. And that's just amazing. Well, let me tell you about that a little bit before we go to that slide. He says, if you speak in a negative, what you're reinforcing in your brain is the very thing you, you want to avoid. And this is the reason. When I say to you, don't think about the white bear, what are you thinking about? The white bear. And you'll keep thinking about the white bear because I told you not to and every time you try to think about something else, the brain will remind you, you're not supposed to be thinking about the white bear. It's ridiculous. But that's how most of us grew up being told don't. Only tell your brain what you want it to do as if it's a done deal. Because if you say don't, that's the first picture that will go into your brain and the subconscious is not always very good at reversing that picture. And besides, how would it reverse that? If I say to you, don't think about the white brain, what would you reverse the picture to? What would you reverse it to? That's the problem, you have no idea. Are, am I even talking about a bear? And this is what we tell our kids. Don't touch the stove. What's the picture? Touching the stove. So they touch the stove and we punish the kid who gave them the incorrect type of instructions. It can be changed. It's not always easy, but it can be changed. So think thoughts only about the positive things you want to have happen. That does not mean that everything you think will happen. It means that you're not messing yourself up by saying don't. And you are not negatively impacting all your brain's neurochemistry by a negative thought. Tell your brain what you're doing as if it's a done deal because your brain never gets in gear until it thinks it's imminent. So I would say to my brain, you start with your name so your brain knows who it's talking about. I'm not talking about Dr. Lowe. I'm not talking about Ted. I'm talking about me. I gotta tell my brain who I'm talking about. Arlene, you are a super centenarian. The brain goes, oh, okay, I didn't realize that. You're a super centenarian with good mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, social, and whatever else you want to put in the blank. That's no guarantee I will be a super centenarian. It guarantees that I got a better shot at it because I have told my brain what I expect in language that the subconscious can read. That's the picture. There is a payoff for positive thinking. It's huge. This is work done by Doc Childer and Howard Martin that are the, I guess you'd say, the co-founders of the heart math solution that studies the relationship between the heart and the brain. Read this second paragraph with me. Your habitual attitude Reading aloud 10 minutes a day is an anti-aging strategy. I'm giving you an opportunity. <laughs> Your habitual attitudes form neural circuits in the brain. If you choose to maintain a specific attitude, the brain can literally rewire itself to facilitate that attitude. What do you think of that? You can rewire your own brain but you do it by the attitude you maintain. All right, where's the opening on this box? <laughs> you got it, it's all over the place. Your right frontal lobe wants variety. 
you know, I've had to actually put down my remote at some lectures because as the people looked at that picture and their right frontal lobe went, okay, I see it, the opening is on the right, oh, no, it isn't, it's on the front, oh, my goodness, it's at the back, they think I'm advancing it with the remote. No, your brain's doing that. And that's why these kind of puzzles are great for your brain. Look for them. There's lots of them, some even on my website. All right, number three, live the 2080 rule. In case you don't remember, we talked about this a couple visits ago. The brain is the first system to recognize a stressor. It reacts with nanosecond speed. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. I mean, not that I can't even process how fast that is. If it thinks there's a stressor, it's already triggered the stress response. That will last for up to 72 hours before your body rebalances the stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline and so on. And if you keep rehearsing what happened to you, I think there's, I've met some people who've lived in the stress response for 30 years because every time you trigger it. So let's say that I have a flat tire on my way to Camarillo and I just got here in time and it was a little stressful but I have AAA and I have a cell phone so that I'll be prepared and I made it. But when I get here, I sit Dr. Lowe and Flo down and I say, do you want to know what happened to me on the way here today? Okay, they probably don't, but I want to rehearse it, and I can do a Broadway performance of telling them how scary it was when I blew a tire, and I didn't know when AAA would get here, and I hope I had cell phone function. Okay, I've just re-triggered the stress response 72 more hours, and then I get back to Bakersfield, and I tell everybody in the office about this traumatic experience. Okay, 72 more hours. And then I'm home at Napa and I tell the neighbor, I thought I was going to miss speaking. We do that, stop it. So here's a couple more brain scans. This is an optimal brain function. Can you see how nice and bright it is? All right, well, here's the, here's the brain that's very stressed and depressed. And you can see, if you understand a little bit about the brain, that a lot of that is sort of right in the middle where the two amygdala, the pair of them, reside. And those little teeny, you know, almond-shaped organs are all about negativity and fear and stress and anger and so on. So it's not worth being stressed. Got to figure out a way to manage that. Epictetus, second century Greek philosopher. I'm cl I clearly put that on my slides now because a couple years ago I was talking to a group of university freshmen and we were talking about how they can think positively to do better in school. I said, I just got back from Greece and I learned a lot about a man named Ep Epictetus. Some hunk in the back says, did you get to meet him on the trip? <laughs> Which of course made me laugh. <laughs> he must think I'm way over the hill. So he was a slave initially and, and I don't know all the details about how he became a slave, some kind of war. And evidently he was very good at what he did. And he, but he didn't like being a slave, I mean, hello. Tried to run away, he got caught, and his master busted up his leg badly, and so it never healed right, and so he always had to walk with a crutch, could not get around much. But that man must have had a brain, and this is what he said. Read this one with me. It isn't so much what happens to you that matters, as much as what you think about what happens to you. Do you get it? 
it really doesn't much matter. If you couldn't prevent, avoid, or control it and something bad happened to you, it's not so much what happens to you that's going to majorly impact your life as what? As what you think about it. How much weight are you giving it? How much importance are you giving it? According to researcher Al Siebert, and try to memorize this, in fact, read this out loud with me too, because that means you're paying attention and your brain is more likely to save it tonight when it does its review. All right, let's go. According to researcher Al Siebert, no stress exists in any situation unless an individual human brain perceives something as a stressor and experiences strain. The stress is less the result of what actually occurs or exists objectively and far more because of the way in which the brain perceives what is happening. Do you get the significance of that? Next time you feel really stressed, ask yourself how much of this is due to what just happened and how much is due to what I think about what happened and it, how bad it was and how it's going to impact my life. And I'm remembering to do that more and more and it's fabulous and that goes back to the reason the old saying, one person's pleasure is another person's pain. Because every brain is different and every brain perceives things differently. Deborah Van Gasser is a researcher who's been studying stress, especially in the female brain. And this is what she has found, that the female stress signaling system is more sensitive from the get-go, even when there's no stress. It's just more hyper alert. And the bottom line is that women, in general, tend to overreact to a perceived stressor. And men, guess what? They tend to underreact. And the reality is somewhere in the middle. So sometimes men say, well, this is good. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not reacting to this stressor. And I'm going, think again. You go to Pakistan to serve in the armed forces and what's happening you don't think is any big deal and you come home with PTSD because it was a big deal. And males are more likely to have a major depressive episode in midlife than are females. Now, of course, it's not wonderful that females overreact because that puts them at higher risk for depression and PTSD, especially if they come back from the service or something bad happens. But be aware of that. Now, this is what the words of Epictetus have been turned into, the 2080 rule. Only 20% of the stress is due to the event. 80% is due to what you think about the event and the weight you give to it. So you can't necessarily do every, anything about the 20% unless you're really preventive and avoid it. And 50% of all our problems could be avoided, some studies say, because we contributed to it. You can do everything about the 80%, everything. So even when there is a viable realistic stressor, you can handle the 80% if you choose to do so. The slash on a no smoking sign runs toward the bottom right or towards the bottom left? Okay, I heard some right. Who thinks it's the right? Who thinks it's the left? Okay, far more people think it's the left. All right, let's see which one it is. How aware have you been? It's not good or bad, but it's some indicator that you're floating through life, not being very aware. And you might want to change that because your brain's going to save what? what it thinks you paid attention to. 
So, you know, you got a partner here, you got a wife or a husband, you know, how aware are you are of, uh, how aware are you of them? Because your brain's going to know whether you're paying any attention to them or not or just blowing them off. A standard paper clip has how many curves? Who says three? Okay, any other options? Two? Four? Boy, I'm glad we're not voting. <laughs> I love to do these things. You know, I have to try to pull the picture up in my head because I'm not very visual. All right, here we go. At least that does look like a paper clip to me, so, all right. Four, we're getting there. Two to go. Be intentional. Read this with me. Older adults who have the attitude that life circumstances are manageable, meaningful, and that you are in control of your life, at least to some degree, tended to have stronger immune systems and better health. The most important factor in healthy aging is life satisfaction. The most important. So are you satisfied with your life? Good. If you're not, do what you need to do to become satisfied. Because it is the most important factor in healthy aging. I'm not only satisfied with my life, I love my life. And I'm so grateful that I never became a doctor. Sorry, Dr. Lowe. Because <laughs> he can do that part. I'm, I'm just so grateful I'm still in my career when all of this stuff about the brain is coming out because it's marvelous. Smile at others intentionally. When I go shopping, I have so much fun with this. I just started doing this. If I'm walking down an aisle or down the street and somebody looks at me, I always smile. Problem is, one guy almost fell down the other day. I think he was, <laughs> I think he was so surprised somebody smiled at him that he didn't know. But I do that, and it's fun. I'd say 85% of the time people look at me and then smile back. About 15% of the time they look at me and I'm sure they think, boy, I wonder what her mental diagnosis is. <laughs> but most of the time they smile back. Be intentional about that. Do you know that when somebody smiles, it triggers all kinds of changes in the brain, including giving them a shot of dopamine, shot of serotonin, shot of endorphins. You've just done them a favor. And all you did was smile at them. But here's the deal. Same thing happened to you. So, worth it. Now, random acts of kindness. I like to do them. Follow a longevity lifestyle intentionally. Because we got the research. Starts in the brain. I love the quote by Helen Keller. Some of you may have read that before. Uh, read it with me. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. It never fails to give me goosebumps. That woman was deaf and blind and she was amazing. I wish I had been able to meet her. So successful agers tend to be intentional. They control what they can and tend to live life with great enthusiasm. As one super centenarian told me, I'm far too busy and happy to die young. You see, wellness is just the slowest rate at which you can die. 
and still maintain all of your faculties. That's a great way to look at it as far as I'm concerned. So is this familiar to you? What's the other name for this? The serenity prayer. Good. Read it with me. Give me courage to change what must be altered, serenity to accept what cannot be helped, and the insight to know the one from the other. And the insight is what's really, really important. So if you have a negative mindset, you can change that. You can't change a chronological age. Hope, hope you know which is, diff, which is which. But here's the deal. Because we're learning so much about health and wellness, the people who choose to live a longevity lifestyle, guess what? 70 is the new 50. 80 is the new 60. 90 is the new 70. 100 is the new 80. 110 is the new 90. 120 is the new 100. We really are seeing that happen with the centenarians and super centenarians, and I'm <laughs> liking that idea. A regulation highway stop sign has how many sides? Some of you must have actually stopped. <laughs> <laughs> So any other option, how, any other numbers? Six. Six? Hope nobody says three. <laughs> okay, how many? Now, I'm not visual, meaning I know you're out there. I hear sounds faster than anything. You know. I have eyes, I can see, but I don't really do detail. But every brain can visualize. That's not a sensory preference, if you will. It's the ability to reproduce in your mind something that you've seen or produce something in your mind that you've never seen, which is what artists do often when they, just, they picture something and then paint it. So the only way I can do things like this is to close my eyes, imagine that I'm sitting at the stop sign, and remember what it looks like and count it. And some of you actually may be like that too. All right, last one, laugh and have fun. I tell you, laugh and last is what laughter is all about. So, studies, minimum of 30 mirthful laughs per day, but on average, people in the United States get less than half of that. Which means some people are not laughing at all. And I'll bet you, you know some of them. I have a few family members with that particular disease. And it's really interesting come holidays and the families get together. So we're just busting up over something, and they're sitting there. Go figure, that makes us laugh. We try not to do that, but anyway. So mirthful laughter is a whole brain experience. Now, back to, remember, the brain benders. Language is in the left hemisphere. Broca's area for audible speech, Wernicke's area for, for heard speech, decoded speech, uh, writing and so on is also there. But the spatial relationships are in the right hemisphere. So that makes it a whole brain exercise. Well, humor and laughter are a bit like that. Laughter is just a sound comes out of Broca's area, the same place you have audible speech. But the left hemisphere likes to be amused. So it'll laugh at almost anything if you just prompt it to. The right hemisphere has a sense of humor. It's not a sound, it is a mental faculty. That means that Every brain within the bounds of normal is born with software already in place for a sense of humor. You just have to develop it. Doesn't develop on its own. 
You have to develop it. But if you have a dynamite sense of humor and you're healthy enough to laugh at yourself, <laughs> anywhere in the world I go, I carry with me an unending supply of triggers for laughter. You know, I have difficulty when I get to Australia remembering which way to look. I do them a favor, I do not drive in Australia. <laughs> Ever. So, mirthful laughter is a whole brain experience. Use your sense of humor to trigger laughter. That then triggers endorphins, the brain's natural morphine, plus a whole cadre of other chemicals. It is so good for us. Studies at UC Berkeley found, and pay attention to this, increase your awareness, a significant association between higher levels of cognitive activity, that means your thinking, over a lifetime, and lower levels of beta amyloid, a protein that's the hallmark of Alzheimer's. PET scans, people with no Alzheimer's symptoms who had engaged in cognitively stimulating activities throughout their lives had way fewer of those deposits. So here's two more PET scans. Here's a normal brain. I'm assuming that's a brain that developed a good sense of humor and chose to laugh. Any of you eldest children or only children? Yeah, me too. Statistically, we don't laugh. We may have a dynamite sense of humor, but we haven't chosen to laugh, and I think it's because our parents practiced on us. And when we laugh, they told us to stop laughing. Don't laugh. Okay, change that. Because we, in that group, are the type of people who will see something and say, that was really funny, Dr. Lowe, don't you think? That was pretty hysterical. He'll go, yeah, you're right. No, it's a laughter that pumps all these chemicals. You just use that to trigger it. And we have to... How many of you are eldest or only again? Oh, yeah, well, we got work to do. <laughs> we, honestly, research shows we have to train ourselves to laugh. I, love, I got a good sense of humor, I think, from my father. He was funny as a broken crutch. But my mother never laughed. She thought his humor was lame. Um, I've trained myself to laugh. Somebody asked me the other day, how did you do that? I said, well, I started standing in front of a mirror just looking at myself and starting to laugh. <laughs> and he said, were your clothes on or off? <laughs> it's very funny. <clears throat> okay, so learn, hone your sense of humor, and if anything funny happens, choose to laugh because it is a choice. It really is a choice. But the research is clear. You want to be a super centenarian? Hone your sense of humor and start laughing. Okay, let's finish up with how to grow older gracefully. Drive carefully. Never in Australia or Britain. Especially when you are coping with stressors. It's not only cars that can be recalled by their maker. <laughs> be careful what you say during episodes of high stress. If you can't be kind, be silent. Or at least have the decency to be vague. Never put both feet in your mouth at the same time. Or you won't have a leg to stand on. Birthdays are very good for you. The more you have, the longer you live, so learn to enjoy them. Stop the mad competitive rush. Don't you know it's the second mouse that gets the cheese? Learn from crayons. Some are sharp, some are pretty, some are dull, some have weird names, and all are different colors. But they all have to live in the same box. 
And this is what I'm finding fascinating. I thought we were way past racial and cultural problems. Apparently not. But I tell people who have trouble with whatever, skin color is totally irrelevant. Totally. Because our brains are all the same color. And we live in the same box. And I hope in my lifetime we get that eventually. Sleep late whenever possible. <laughs> it's the early worm that gets eaten by the bird. <laughs> Except that some days you're the pigeon and some days you're the statue. Practice mirthful laughter on the days that you're the statue. Now, if you've never seen a pigeon on a statue, you won't think that's funny. The truly happy and those who are growing older gracefully are the ones who can actually enjoy the scenery on a detour. So some of us may need to go home and make some alterations. I hope you do so, because when I come back next year, I'd like you to be here. Thank you. So Dr. Arlene has offered to give away some things of hers. And so, <laughs> not, except her purse, things she's written. So, who, who, came, who came the farthest today, tonight? Who came the farthest away? Jeff? Calabasas. Anyone come from farther away than Calabasas? Yeah? Where? West Hills. Uh, that's a little bit far. Okay, yes? Duarte. Duarte. Okay, that's farther so far. Anybody farther than Duarte? What? San Bernardino. Anyone farther than San Bernardino? All right, come on up here. We'll let you choose something. We have um, brain benders, age proofing your memory, just the facts, some children's kind of stories. Whichever, which one would you like here? Got a whole array here. You like the brain benders. Huh? You're going to study those tonight for tomorrow, so yeah. the brain benders that we're going to see some more tomorrow. Liz, we were going through the, the, the depression in my ribs, sitting next to my wife. Kept getting oh, you're getting a depression too, huh? <laughs> That's a new form of depression. <laughs> Women learn male humor. They are funny as a crutch. <laughs> They're five times funnier than we are statistically. But you have to learn their humor. Women like left brain to humor, word stuff. Men like slapstick and, you know, crazy stuff. But they're funny. Now, this is what I see happen. I went out to dinner the other night with four couples sat down around the table, and some guy, first thing he says is what? Women tell me, what's the first thing he said? Have you heard this joke? <laughs> now, men connect with other men socially through telling jokes. We don't even understand them. <laughs> so, this woman elbows her husband harder than I thought was necessary, and said, oh, I'm sure they've already heard it. Besides, when I heard it, I didn't think it was funny. Well, you won't think it's funny because you didn't get it. <laughs> and the men, it doesn't matter if they've heard it before, they're going to laugh. Because that's how males connect. Now, there are universities that are holding entire classes to teach women how to understand male humor. Go take one. 
What is that class called? <laughs> Understanding gender differences in humor. I think you gave us that talk, what, two years ago, right? Maybe. Yeah, maybe so. There, there are a few people that could use that. Not in my household. They all understand my humor. I think it's despicable, but they understand it. Okay, so who came the far next farthest? Duarte? Right? Duarte? All right. You get the next choice. All right, let's find out who's the oldest. Who's, who's the oldest here? Anyone over 80? 81? 82? 83? 84? 85? Do I have anything higher than 85? Leonard? What? 90? Anybody higher than 90? Leonard, 90 what? One. Anyone higher than 91? Going once. Going twice. Sold. Come on, Leonard. You can pick. We've got um, Age Proof in Your Memory, The Adventures of Stella, and Adventures of the Longevity Mystery Club. Yeah, well, I'm sure he's got kids or grandkids. He may be great grandkids. So, which ones would you like here? Seven and eight. Okay, which one would you like? This is your pick. That one? Okay. All right, great. Adventures, you you're welcome. All right, who's got the closest birthday today? Today's your birthday, Arlene. Come on down. We won't ask you how old you are, we just know your birthday today. Well, congratulations, happy birthday. All right, so you get to pick between the adventures of Stella for little kids or age-proofing your memory, the ultimate brain builder. You need the age-proofing your, your brain, okay, your memory. Okay, remember that. All right, last one. Let's see. Who has the most, oh, this is, sounds like a kid. Who has the most number of grandchildren? Children, let's say, gra children and grandchildren. Anyone more than five? Okay, anyone more than six? Six? That's it? Six is our highest? Oh, six, okay, seven? Seven. Eight, eight, nine, nine, okay, we're tied, ten, all right, Jeff, it's yours, what, oh, you have eleven, okay, you're the clear winner, all right, this you can have for your grandkids, great, you have any great grandkids, not yet, yeah, <laughs> All right, congratulations. All right. <laughs> so stick around. We'll have more tomorrow afternoon to give away. But uh, Arlene is going to continue with some of her uh, other topics. I don't know if you know them. Uh, did you get a handout? There's a, some flyers. Maybe they're in the, in the uh, foyer uh, of her topics tomorrow. Tomorrow morning will be bigotry, bias, Yeah, they're all B words. The good B words, not the bad B words. Okay. <laughs> and, okay, positive B words. Well, they're not really positive, but I mean, they're not, they're not horrible B words. And then, because um, I can think of some good B words that you, know, you wouldn't want to put in your title. Um, so, um, then, and also the last one on thinking. 
And uh, Arlene was giving me some interesting food for thought about that, actually, because she says, you know, we really don't know how thinking really occurs, you know, the, the physiology of thinking. So I'm going to be interested to what she's going to have tomorrow for us in the morning. And then the after oh, she's going to lie. And then in the afternoon, we're going to talk about emotions. So there's something, you know, thinking part and then the emotion part. And, yeah, e EQ, right, emotional intelligence. That's the emotion, feeling, and all that kind of part. So anyway, we uh, thank you for coming tonight, and uh, uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for coming. Tomorrow's at 9.30, 9.30 and 10.45. Okay, good night. Okay, now, um, am I going to be able to get in the gate? Or